We are very honored today to be joined by His Excellency Jakai Kukweti, former President of Tanzania, the Right Honorable Makitsi Majoro, Prime Minister of Lesotho, the Honorable Lila Dukan Lakuman, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Education of Mauritius, and Dr. Mohamed Pate, Global Health Director at the World Bank and former Nigerian Health Minister. So this is requiring governments now to completely um, rethink their priorities as they begin to imagine the path forward. Um, how would you suggest governments recalibrate their national development agendas to this new reality? I think if there's one thing that has become evident now more than ever is the centrality of health and human capital in terms of overall uh, national security and economic security. And so investing in health We've been making the case for years, and others have, all, of course, been making that, that same argument. But I think what has transpired with the pandemic really puts it uh, straight that of all public policy choices that governments have to make, investing in the social sectors, in basic healthcare, education, protecting the poorest and most vulnerable, actually pays dividend. When we see countries, the poorest, the middle income and the high income countries all struggling. So uh, leaving people behind is no longer an option. I think the, the first thing is, the question is how would governments mitigate and, and minimize the effects of decreased resources, particularly on the core human development, the human development indicators. I think there are a few things that, that I think, um, I think could, could, could be done so that we don't lose everything. We don't lose everything or get to a point where we have to start it as, as if we are just build, be, 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 be building a fresh. First, governments, the, the response to COVID-19 of governments has got to be measured. Measured in the sense that it should not be too little, not to be effective. Sure. But it should not be too excessive to, to be wasteful or to create an unnecessary disruptive, cause unnecessary destructive effects on, 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 on the programs, projects, and activities. <clears throat> because if, 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 we, if, we, if, we, if we if we can succeed in doing that, if government can succeed in doing that, then there, there, there is going to be proper, proper, proper balance. There is going to be response to, to, to the disease, but at the same time, uh, there is going to be minimize or mitigate the effects on, on the core, core human development I, I, I indicators. Uh, in your own situation in Mauritius, um, where have you kind of drawn the line to say, you know, these are what we think are the absolute essentials and what would you recommend to other ministers? In fact, it's true. Uh, after the COVID experience, most of the ministries have been asked to cut down on their expenditure. But you know, as far as education is concerned, we do feel that COVID situation has made it even more important. And now it has become of paramount importance to ensure that investment for our learners keeps on increasing. Because we've come across a situation, unprecedented certainly, but where we had to quickly find means to sort of ensure that there is continuity in education. As UNESCO had stated, in over 192 countries, we had school closures and it impacted upon 91.4% of students across the world. So here Mauritius, our main uh, concern was how to ensure that students keep in touch with their studies. So yeah. we came up with a number of measures, ad hoc measures, running courses on TV, etc., online teaching, but we felt that such adocracy cannot stay for long. We need to come up with resilience plans and we need to invest massively to ensure that our students remain connected, that the school teacher pupil connectivity is maintained. Mm -hmm. So we have managed to get some investment sort of uh, 
guaranteed for the education sector, especially where technology is concerned. And uh, special efforts have been made by the Ministry of Finance to ensure that at least such expenditure, thought, uh, let's say, well thought uh, of projects have to be maintained. And this is where we're headed. We feel that we can't afford not to because COVID has come. This is one scourge. We'll be having many others and we need to prepare ourselves. Preparedness mm -hmm. has become a major issue. And mm -hmm. in the education sector, this would involve investment in technology, but also in capacity building, preparation of the manpower to ensure that we can cope in crisis situations. The premise is um, that um, investment in, in human development, in health education in particular, but also obviously many other areas uh, related to human development, um, it, it correlates to economic growth. Um, and you've been finance minister for many years, so I'm, I'm imagining that you've had opportunity to see whether this is in fact the case. Um, do, do you, are you able to say um, that um, because of the investments in these areas over the past number of years, Lesotho has seen economic benefit? Well, Lesotho is a, a, a bit of a peculiar country. And I, I, was, I was looking at, at, at this question to try to understand whether we have evidence that can confirm uh, such a relationship. But Lesotho is peculiar in, in that compared to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, it invests twice more than uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa does. But the outcomes are just absolutely terrible. So yes, lots of investments uh, last two decades compared to, to Sub-Saharan Africa. But the health outcomes and education outcomes uh, are very poor. If, if we were to look at um, uh, where you are seeing some value of investment in education, for example, it is investment in tertiary education. Uh, the, yeah, the returns there are clear and uh, significant, but the returns are to a very small section of society, the larger portion of our youth who, who are drop out at, at basic education level, remain outside the economy. And by the way, uh, Lesotho is a country that has depended more on migrant labor, as well as uh, uh, international taxes from our arrangement called SACU. So the, the normal uh, process of countries starting small, everybody hustling for a life and creating um, rudimentary markets hasn't really grounded in Lesotho. And so that, that, uh, that relationship is not very clear, uh, but it's not lost on us. That, that's, that's the path we need to travel. Uh, the migrant labor uh, process is, is winding up. There's only very few people now in, in South Africa. And uh, uh, SACU revenues and SACU itself is probably going to uh, disappear in the context of continental and uh, regional free trade areas. So uh, we need to get to a point where that relationship will actually we, uh, must come to, we recognize that it must be the case that if you invest in people and invest in everybody and give them good health, necessarily you must reap uh, better uh, returns in economic growth. 